All right. So, so that, is, that is just one of you know, a million different examples, a million different stories of, of the kind of things going on in our world today right now um, that, that people are dealing with and that we are gathering as God's people to commit to, to praying for. That's, again, what this Freedom Sunday is, is all about. All I want to do here just before we go to prayer is to just take a look at, at a passage from God's Word, um, which I'm praying as, as we go through this is really just going to inspire, like light up our hearts as we go to prayer to inspire us both in what it is we're doing and who it is we're praying to. So let's, let's do that. Let's get into this. So if, if you've got a Bible with you, Bible app, if you could turn to the book of Acts, the fifth book into the New Testament, Acts chapter 12, uh, turn there with me. We're going to read this incredible story in the life of the early church and Peter in particular. Uh, so if you got that, go there, Acts 12, and then we'll read this together. Luke writes this. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, note, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands, and the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals, and he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out uh, along one street, and immediately the angel left him. Now, when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to those, uh, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, and many were gathered together and were praying. And when he had knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. <laughs> and, said to, and they said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, oh, it is his angel. But Peter <laughs> continued knocking. And when they opened... They saw him and were amazed, but motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. And then he departed and went to another place. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let me just quickly pray for us for a second and then jump into this. Spirit of God, we ask you to just take this word now and, and, and inspire our hearts as we prepare to go to prayer as your people, just inspire our hearts with it, accomplish your purpose with it, O oh God. Do that, I pray. And, and as I always ask, would you move and govern my tongue to speak your truth? Amen. Okay, so, I don't know, this, this story in, in the book about, this has got to be one of actually my favorite stories in, in all of the Bible, actually. Certainly a highlight in the book of Acts in particular. It's just got like, so many elements of an amazing story. I mean, you got suspense, drama, you got humor, like that whole scene at the door where Peter's knocking and the lady's just like, it's Peter, just runs off and he's kind of like, oh, I kind of need to get in. I can't really be standing around out here. Like, love that. That's awesome. And then, of course, it's just this miraculous, incredible rescue, just so many incredible parts of this story. That's why I love it. And while there's lots of different reasons for us to look at a passage like this, one of the reasons that I want to look at it today in particular on Freedom Sunday is because of some of the key things that it teaches us about prayer. 
prayer, which if you didn't know, maybe this is your first Freedom Sunday that you're a part of, is what this day for the church participating around the whole world is all about. Namely, worship of and prayer to God, earnest prayer to God on behalf of the over 40 million men, women, and children currently held in slavery today. But as we give our focus to something like prayer today, I think beyond whatever it is that God is going to accomplish through our prayers and through the prayers of his church around the world, and I believe he's going to accomplish incredible things, even above and beyond what we can imagine or think to ask him for, I think we could be in danger of missing out on on a large portion of the spiritual benefit that I believe God wants to pour out both through our prayers, as well as work in each one of us as we gather together to do this, if we don't pause for just a few minutes and and remind ourselves of two things. We remind ourselves of exactly what prayer is and is not, as well as who it is that we're crying out in prayer to. So all all I want to do together, just really quickly, is, is highlight a few key things that just to keep that we can learn about from prayer in this incredible story from Acts 12, just to help prepare our hearts, just, just prepare us in every way, uh, spiritually, cognitively, uh, as we go to prayer, uh, what it is that we're about to do together. Just prepare ourselves that way through this and then just get to it. Like, I want to get beyond this and just get into prayer because that's really the focus of what we're doing today, crying out together as God's people around the world for an end to slavery. And and, and those two key things about prayer that I want to show you in particular from this passage are these. I want to show you our response of prayer and then God's response to prayer. Right? So, so we, we see a need, we see injustice, our response of prayer to God, and then how it is that God responds to those prayers, as we have evidence here and so many other places in Scripture. So if you still got your Bibles there, your Bible app, whatever it is, can you keep it open or open it up again to that passage in Acts chapter 12. Follow along with me as we look at this incredible story in the life of Peter and the early church's earnest prayer for freedom on his behalf. Okay, so let's look first of all at our response of prayer. Our response of prayer. So if you know the story of the early church as we have recorded for us in the book of Acts, although the story seems like it's taking an encouraging turn from the martyrdom of Stephen and the, and the ravaging of the church upon Saul's conversion in Acts chapter 9, it seems like, oh, okay, maybe it's getting better. What, what we see here in Acts 12 is that the persecution of the church is still very much going on as evidenced by the martyrdom of James, the brother of John, at the hands of King Herod. Okay, it's definitely still very much going on. Now, it can be kind of confusing in the New Testament because uh, we hear a lot about all kinds of different Herods, particularly through the life of Jesus, and so, but then we hear about them dying, and so it's like, well, wh- is he there? Is he not? Super understandable. What, what history tells us is that this Herod in our passage is Herod Agrippa I. Herod Agrippa I, who was the grandson of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the one you read about in the beginning of Luke's gospel who was trying to put Jesus to death after his birth when the wise men came and said, where is the king of the Jews? That's that Herod. So Herod from our passage is the grandson of that Herod the Great. Uh, the, the Herod in our passage, Herod Agrippa, it was also the nephew to Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas, who, who was the one ruling during uh, much of Jesus' earthly ministry and the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. So that's that Herod. Um, so following the death of that Herod, Herod uh, Antipas, uh, this, this Herod, Herod Agrippa, was put in power over the Jews, really but by what amounts to some of his college buddies growing up, uh, who had come to power in Rome, guys like uh, an emperor Cal- Cal- Caligula, these kind of guys. So they, they put him in power here in Jerusalem. And, and like every tetrarch before him, Herod now has the, the difficult and, and really tricky balancing act through his reign of trying to appease both the Romans and the Jewish people at the same time. Not an easy thing, but chillingly, one of the ways Luke tells us that Herod tried to do this himself was by violently persecuting this pesky, disruptive movement called the Way, which just wouldn't seem to go away even after they'd had their leader put to death. He decides to 
persecute the church. And, and stage one of his violent plan, as we see in verse 2 there, is to have James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword, that is, beheaded. And when Herod, says here, saw that it, quote, pleased the Jews, there in verse 3, and, and by Jews, it's sort of just a, a broad term there, meaning both religious leaders as well as all those who would identify themselves as devout Jews. It, it pleases them to, to see that he's put James to death. He decides now, to, stage two now, is going to be to arrest Peter as well. He's going to have Peter arrested. But because the, the, the Jews, we read here, are, are still in the midst of their Passover celebration, that's what's going on uh, at the same time as this. Being the, the culturally savvy tyrant that he is, Herod decides to leave Peter in prison until after the Passover is complete before bringing him out to public trial before the people and, and very likely execution. But again, if, if you know the flow of the book of Acts and given the multiple divine rescues that Peter experienced already up until this point, we read about at least two, I think one of the reasons that Luke highlights the martyrdom of James in particular here is not only to highlight the faithfulness of one of Jesus' closest followers, even unto death, but also to help us, to show us the seriousness of this situation for Peter. He wants us to see, like we could just uh, think like, oh, you know what, it's going to be fine. Peter always gets released. It's like, no, 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 this is really bad. It's really serious now. Like, so, so not only is Peter delivered over to four squads of soldiers, one for each three-hour watch of the night, and, and chained, verse 6 tells us, between two soldiers through the night, following the stoning of Stephen, and now the beheading of James, what has become terrifyingly clear by now for the church as well is that faithfulness to Jesus does not equal a freedom from suffering, freedom from death, even for the leaders of the church, even for the apostles. Nobody is, like, safe right now here. And yet in response to these most dire of circumstances and the seemingly impossible odds, the response of God's otherwise powerless church, as we see in verse 5, look there, is a response of prayer. That's their response. They, they, their response to this is to pray earnestly for Peter. And I don't know, like, I, I know for many of us, even those, those of us who, who pray, we say, I pray regularly. In a day of, like, thoughts and prayers, responses to tragedies we see in the news and on social media, it could almost seem like they decided to pray they held a prayer meeting. Like It could seem like prayer is a non-response to Peter's impending death. Just as I know, it could easily feel that exact same way today for us, praying about the victims of modern-day slavery. Like We could just be like, well, yeah, sure, prayer, my prayer's fine, good, but, but what are you actually going to do to help? Ever felt like that? Yeah, okay, praying, good, but what are you actually going to do? And I think a reaction like that, which I completely understand and, and can honestly identify with myself is as a result of one of two under, wrong understandings okay so so the first wrong understanding i think is a wrong understanding of god leads us to that response where, where, where we see god as either being indifferent to our suffering or as incapable of doing anything about our suffering right so that is just like uh, i believe that god either can't be bothered with the, the you know, billions of Prayer requests that he gets every day just like shoved into the proverbial uh, suggestion box. It's just like he doesn't even open it. Like he's just indifferent to that. Or that God is like, yeah, he'd, he'd really like to help, but you know, there's only so much he can do. Right? Like, it, I, like yes, absolutely, without question. Either, if that's your understanding of God, either one of those, it makes perfect sense why you'd see prayer for Peter then, or our praying for victims of modern-day slavery today as a non-answer to the problem. That's not really going to accomplish anything. So that's one wrong understanding. The other is a wrong understanding of prayer. And there's all kinds of ways that we get prayer wrong and don't understand it rightly. But as I'm thinking about this today, one of the things that I, I know we can feel, and I've even heard people literally say, is something like this. Well, I know that God is sovereign over everything. He's going to accomplish His sovereign will regardless. So whatever I pray isn't going to make a difference anyway. Ever heard someone say that before or felt that way yourself? Well, let's, cause, man, that sounds super spiritual, right? That sounds really mature. I, I understand that God is sovereign. I'm just 
Trust in the Lord. I'm just going to leave it up to him. But, but again, it, once again, is an understanding that would see prayer, us doing this today, this church praying in as a, a non-response or as a non-answer to the problem. And yet the problem with those, as I said, is that both of those understandings are wrong. Like they're both not right. For, for, first of all, like rather than being indifferent to us, God, God is revealed again and again in his word as a loving, compassionate father with his children. He is invested. He's, he's a part of our lives, absolutely. And rather than being willing but unable to help, he's revealed as having power and ability beyond limits, beyond our imagination even to, to comprehend. And yes, yeah, well, yes, the Bible does teach the absolute sovereignty of God in all things. Yes, what it also reveals is that God has sovereignly appointed certain means by which he's chosen to accomplish his will, one of which being our prayers. Did you know that? That God has sovereignly chosen to, to use our prayers as one of the means by which he accomplishes his will. So again, although it sounds like humility to say, I don't need to pray because God's going to do his thing no matter what, what you need to realize is that's not an understanding of prayer that was either taught or practiced anywhere in Scripture. And then, beyond that, then you've got to be able to do something with a God who commands and instructs people all through the Bible in a practice that makes no difference whatsoever in the outcome of, of something. Because why would he do that? Why would God command his people all through his word to pray? Why does Jesus teach his disciples to pray? If it doesn't matter, it doesn't mean anything. But what we see in our passage here today is that because the church understood God and prayer rightly, rather than seeing prayer as a non-response to Peter's imprisonment and impending death, the church, listen, saw prayer as their primary means of taking action, their primary means of helping. As John Stott describes it, quote, Here then were two communities, the world and the church, arrayed against one another, each wielding an appropriate weapon. On the one side was the authority of Herod, the power of the sword and the security of the prison. On the other side, the church turned to prayer, which is the only power which the powerless possess. John Polehill put it this way. While Peter waited in prison, the Christians used their most effective means of assistance. They prayed continually for him. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so, all right, so that's the first key to prayer that we see in our passage that I think we need to apply directly to our prayers this morning for these victims of modern day slavery as, as we see this, this desperate need in front of us and then respond in prayer to God. That's, that's the key that we need to apply to our prayers because, yeah, the horrific, heartbreaking situations that we've heard about and that we see all around our world today, they can feel hopeless. They can feel completely beyond our reach, just as I'm sure Peter, chained inside that prison, felt to the church in Jerusalem. And yet, when we understand God and prayer rightly, we can know without a doubt as well that rather than our response of prayer being a non-response, listen, our prayers for the abused, for the forgotten, for the trampled on of this world today is instead accessing the most effective means of assistance we have for them as a church through our prayers. It's accessing the most effective means of assistance we have. Okay, so that's our response of prayer, really just ultimately acknowledging our helplessness, acknowledging our powerlessness to effect change in a hopeless situation, and then through prayer, accessing the, the power of the only one who can. The last key I want to look at together from our passage this morning before we go to prayer ourselves is God's response to prayer. I think this is so, so key that we need to look at this and in inspiring ourselves here. God's response to prayer, and, and of course there's so many examples through the Bible of, of what this looks like and where we could see that. But I want to quickly focus on this response that we see in our passage together, not simply because it's an incredible end to an incredible story in the life of Peter and in the life of the early church, but because my hope is that in seeing God's response to the earnest prayers of his church in the life of this prisoner, the life of Peter, it will inspire each of our hearts 
as we go to prayer for the 40 million prisoners in our world today with a kind of clear vision as to what kind of incredible things God can accomplish in response to the prayers of his people. We would really see that what God can accomplish when we pray. So look, look at verse uh, 6 here. Look at verse 6 and following. We see that it's now the night before Peter will be brought out to public trial and execution. And yet, look at this, chained between two soldiers facing impending death. What's Peter doing? He's sleeping. He's sleeping, and, and not just sleeping, right? Like sleeping hard, so much so that an angel with blinding light come in and still needs to like jab him in the ribs with his staff or whatever. Be like, dude, come on, get up. Uh, crazy, which would almost kind of seem surprising. It seems surprising to be sleeping, although when you think about it, it's not entirely different than the example that Peter had seen years before from Jesus. Sleeping, do you remember, in the back of that boat during the midst of the storm when all the disciples believed they were going to drown? Which, if nothing else, I think is a powerful demonstration of just how much Peter's faith had, had grown and developed since that day. He knows he is so secure in God's hands. He can sleep just as Jesus did in the back of that boat. But then, <clears throat> as you read on, in response to the prayers of his church, we see a miraculous deliverance, right? God sends his angel to rescue Peter so that the chains that once held him simply just fall from his hands. He, he gets up, walks past guards, just like something out of like Frodo out of Lord of the Rings when he's got the one ring to rule them all. He can just walk past them with nobody stopping him, gets to prison gates and they just open of their own accord and Peter is miraculously led out to freedom. If you didn't know the connection, centuries later, actually, Charles Wesley, the famous Him writer would use this exact scene from the life of Peter as a metaphor to describe the freedom from sin that Jesus grants to all who put their trust and faith in him, in that him, and can it be, writing this, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth. And follow thee, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? <laughs> but we're not told exactly what the church was praying for Peter as they gathered there in Mary's home that night. And, and actually, judging from their incredulous response to Peter standing outside knocking on the courtyard door, it makes me wonder, actually, if by now their prayers hadn't shifted from praying for Peter's freedom to now kind of just resigning themselves to the end and praying really just for Peter's a steadfastness and peace in dying. But one of the things we are told is how they prayed. We're told at least how they prayed. And it says here, notice in verse 5, that they had been praying earnestly for him. Earnestly, which scholars note is the exact adverb Luke used to describe Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane when it said he prayed with so much strenuous uh, earnestness that he sweat drops of blood. That The word in Greek actually means to, to stretch something to its breaking point. That's how they were praying. And what we see, look, is that God's response to their earnest, straining, stretching, consistent, continued prayers in his perfect time and according to his unlimited power, again, look at this, was just to orchestrate a divine deliverance for Peter such that the most highly trained Navy SEAL extraction team could not have accomplished today. Like, this is just incredible miraculous response of God to the prayers of his people. But listen, I need you to just hear me, okay? I know. I know that that isn't for a moment to suggest to you that if we just pray hard enough, if we just pray long enough, uh, just with enough strain and energy or whatever it is, that God's always going to intervene exactly in the way that we're asking him to every time. No, he isn't. I know, I know he isn't. And in fact, I think that's another reason that Luke includes the martyrdom of James in this story to help us properly balance our expectations and, and submit ourselves to God's response to our prayers, however and whatever that response may be. And yet, listen, I think the point is that we come today to this time of earnest, concentrated prayer ourselves with a God-sized vision of the kind of deliverance and freedom that God can bring through our prayers 
as opposed to just coming to God with, with prayers that are, are based out of nothing more than what we think is humanly possible to accomplish. So often that's a hindrance to our prayers when we pray that way because when we come to God in prayer believing Him only for what we believe is humanly possible, think about that. Not only does that, does that limit and affect the urgency and earnestness of our prayers, it also causes us to come to the, the sovereign, omnipotent creator God of the universe exactly like that father with a demon-possessed son in Mark 9 with requests to God that, that, that begin with sentences like, you know what, if you can do anything to help. If there's any way that you can make some kind of, make this a little bit better, whatever it is, with, with the clear implication with those kind of prayers that we've already decided that the answer is probably not. Absolutely. When, when, when our vision is stuck here in like what we think is humanly possible, absolutely that affects the size of our prayers. But when we see this the miraculous kind of deliverance that God can bring about. No, then instead, my hope is this inspires us now as we go to prayer to come to God with the kind of prayers that begin with, with words like, God, I know what you can do is make chains fall off people's hands so they can just walk out of a prison unharmed. God, I know what you can do is shut the mouths of lions. You can convert the hearts of jailers. You can Cause this, even the smell of smoke to be kept from staining the garments of people thrown into fiery furnaces. I know that's what you can do. And so on the basis of that, I'm asking you now to do this. I'm asking you to bring freedom for these people. I'm asking you to bring help and hope and restoration and healing on the basis of what I've seen you can do. Do you see? Praying like that. Praying with a God-sized vision and then leaving the response to our prayers. Yeah, leave this response in the, in the hands of a sovereign God who we've already seen. Has not just the ability, but he's demonstrated he, he has the heart and the love to accomplish incredible things. And that he knows what's best. Can leave it in his hands to accomplish according to his perfect will. That's the, those are the kinds of prayers I think that this church was praying for Peter, praying from the moment he got arrested and was in prison, praying prayers like that with a God-sized vision. And I believe those are exactly the kinds of prayers this story should inspire in us now to pray today, to pray prayers like this as the global church cries out together as one in earnest prayer to God for freedom for enslaved people all around the world. And I think we can do that boldly and, and confidently when we have a true picture of both who God is as well as what prayer is. Because the reality, again, is that this is who we're bringing these prayers to this morning. This is the God we're bringing them to, not an, a, a cold and different God, not a nice but ultimately impotent God, but the omnipotent God of the universe who is in absolute sovereign control of all things in heaven and on earth. And yet, a God who still invites us in to join with him in what he's doing. I don't know why he would do that. It seems foolish, and yet, again and again, that's what he sees. He invites us in. Come on, pray, pray, lift your prayers to me. I want to accomplish incredible things through your, by the means of your prayers. Pray to me. Lift your voice to me. So that not only is his own perfect will accomplished, but also our own faith is built and grown in the process as well. I think that's the point. It was Martin Luther, great reformer, who once said, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of his willingness. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, if you had need of a thousand times as much help, I would give it to you. You require little compared to what I am ready to give. Apostle Paul <laughs> said it like this as we looked at it a couple months ago in Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. That's the God. That's the God we, we bring our response of prayer to now. Trusting, as Paul says, that his response to our prayers, really believing that this morning, his response to our prayers will be far above anything that we could even 
think or imagine to ask him for. Believing he's going to do what we ask and even more. And he's got all ability and power to do that. Let's go to him now. As a church, as a global church, with an earnest prayer for freedom.